Praise the Lord. <laughs> I love this time of day. It's like so getting ready for the heat and the hot day and the hot time of the day to come that most people are busy staying inside or getting prepared for just how hot it'll be. So they're looking for shade or adapting and getting ready for today because it's going to be hot. So what happens for me is I get a chance to come out here and sit on a porch, kick back, look around and be thankful, really, for how much blossoming the garden has become that God has helped me to really put together with just the foolish things that, you know, my wife and I like to go do. Like, you know, we're part of the 99. You know the 99 you've heard about in the news? Oh no, not that 99. We're the 99 centers. We go to the 99 cent store. Yeah, we're one of those 99s. Because, you see, we can't afford to do all the things that everybody else does. So we have to penny pinch and watch our money, you know, and use it wisely. But you know what's amazing is when you do that, when you appreciate every cent that you've got, you're able to take things that most people wouldn't even bother with and use them in some way that God can bless and make into a beautiful garden like you see around me. You know, God is a master at doing that. He takes the things that are rejected and makes them the object of His love. When He decides to use someone or something, He can turn something crooked and make it straight. It's amazing what God can do with just the least of things to make them the greatest of all in the kingdom of heaven. That's so wonderful that I see in God's economy that I'm always amazed that any little thing that we do, every little instance where we do something that nobody can see or touch or feel or nobody knows that we've helped someone, God watches and blesses us for that. Isn't that neat? Don't you appreciate someone like that? Someone who isn't looking for the Olympiad, you know, who has been training all his life for just one moment, but rather God is inspiring you for every moment of your life. That you can look at each and every single day of everything you're doing along your way and finding God in it. And that you can inspire someone else to see God, to see how Jesus is moving in your life. And that, I think, is really the point of why we do videos. You know, why relate these things unless they were true? If it didn't happen in my life, believe me, I wouldn't tell you. I'd say, hey, go check out some other way or some other perspective. Go be a philosopher or go get involved in politics or be a sociologist or who knows, maybe be an Olympiad. You know, spend every day of your waking life, you know, exercising and working at it so you could get the gold. And then once you got the gold, you can go do your own thing, right? I mean, isn't that what happens after you set your records and got your accomplishments? You're done. You get to move on. When I was young and a young man, people used to ask me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I used to say, I don't know. <laughs> and even now, if you ask me what I want to be when I grow up, I'd say, I don't know. But I can tell you what God has made me into being. And that's what I think I appreciate more than anything else is that I'm in touch with God, the creator of the universe, who has so arranged life around me that it caused me to come to a conclusion to understand the principles of life in such a way that I could look at what Jesus had said and say, well, if that's true, then prove it to me now. Reveal yourself to me in some way that I understand. So that it's not just faith, and it's not just feeling, and it's not just some mystical idea that I have, or some philosophical acknowledgement that you know somehow I have to put some kind of extra you know belief system into place. But prove to me you're real. Demonstrate in some way that I can understand that if you said you would speak to me, you'll speak to me. And you know, that's the amazing thing. He did. And so <laughs> that's what made me a Christian. I mean, 
if it was all about following some church, well, huh, frankly, you know, I could pretty much kind of like find what's wrong with most everything. You know, there is, <laughs> it's not that hard. You know, or if it was just like following the book, you know, like just the Bible, well, quite frankly, <laughs> and, you know, I could probably come up with quite a few different relief systems that are already out there and understand where they're coming from. But you know, it became so much more because I had to come to a conclusion after reading the book, after seeing what people had done with the book, after understanding how everyone had their own ideas, and their own perspectives, what is this concept that God is alive? What is this reality of this being that supposedly is God? You know, that we say is, you know, in some 12-step program, they uh, you know, say that it's a higher power or some other philosophical thing. They say all roads lead to heaven. And some other, you know, way says, well, God is whatever you make him out to be. Or psychology says, well, it's just the yearning of man to look at something bigger than he is so they can accept himself because he's not able to adapt to the circumstances of life when there's catastrophic events in their life. You know, and I pretty much, you know, read all the arguments and being an intellect that I was as a young man, <laughs> hippie, yeah, I kind of saw through the holes in all those arguments. So I had to have like a direct intervention from God. And that's what happened. When Jesus said that you must be born again, that's what he meant. You must have, literally, some way of an awakening inside you that you can see God because you can't see him without that happening or that you could hear God because you can't hear God without that happening. You have to become, like Jesus said, born again of the Spirit, lest you ever want to understand what on the outside looking in looks like, oh, well, some kind of like, yeah, sure, there's a God. But once you have an encounter with God, you can't ever deny that again. You may not follow, believe, or do like he says to, but that's your choice. But you can't deny that he exists. And that's the reality of what happens to a lot of people. According to the book of Romans in the Bible, it says that every man has known God at some point in time, that God has revealed himself to them. So I have no doubt that whoever you are, wherever you are, at some point in time, God has talked to you. But unfortunately in Romans, it says that when they knew God, they chose not to obey him, but changed the image of God into the corruptible image of man and then went off on a tangent and God gave them over to their tangents and let them go do their thing. And they did. And so you see a lot of people, when you think that on the surface they're dealing with something, you know, like they're an atheist or they're an agnostic or something. No. The Bible says very clearly, no, they had an encounter with God. They just chose to reject what God had to say at the time. Sadly, that means that every single one of us, every human being on the face of the earth, has had an encounter with the Almighty Living God. To me, that's awesome one way, because I think, cool, that means I can trust in the love of God to be made manifest to people, and they can look at it, and they don't have to keep criticizing churches or Christians or people that fail, because they don't know what they're doing, they're just trying to do the best they can. And that's why... I didn't follow any religion, per se. Although I'm a Christian, I followed Jesus because he intervened in my life. And he talks to me, and God talks to me, and he told me I could know the Father, and so I talked to the Father, and he told me that I could have a spirit, so I, you know, the whole shebang. And then going to church was kind of nice because the ones that I went to helped me to understand. Now, sometimes I disagreed, and that was okay. They felt like it was all right to disagree. As long as I'm seeking to study to show myself approved, work may not be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and understanding that God is leading me, then they were just as content as I was to follow after God, wherever that led me. And I think that's what we fail to understand, is that God wants to lead you to himself. God is taking the entire time span we have of birth to death to make known to you that he wants you to come to him. That's it. Bottom line, pure and simple. How you get there, that's a good question. What you do when you get there, that's another good question. Those are things that, in reality, you're going to deal with all of your life. But when you choose to accept what Jesus said about coming to God, when you choose to deal with the reality of, if it works, do it, 
If it doesn't work, don't do it. If you put down, you know, like put your foot down and begin to, you know, get your back up and start using some intelligence instead of some ignorance, and you say, look, I'm going to deal with this as a practical reality, then you'll find that God will deal with you practically. He'll reveal himself in a real way, and you won't have any doubt. But as long as you play wishy-washy, as long as you're goofing around with trying to pretend like you know there's something else out there, then you're really not going to ever find God. You're never going to understand Him speaking to you. You're never going to see Him working in your life. You're never going to hear Him speak audibly to you. And I don't mean read a word and you know make up some kind of feeling about it or get some mystical, magical you know like carpet ride or some kind of like Nirvana experience or a gestalt of you know all the realities of your intellectualism come to, you know crashing in on you into some kind of exaltation of you know a revelation no not at all as a matter of fact sometimes God can come to you in just the most practical way ever imaginable like knocking on your door <laughs> what a shock that would be huh now how he does it is his choice but what he does has all been contained in the scriptures themselves since he created the universe. So the reality of knowing God is up to you. Having known God, though, is up to us to pursue on to know him better. And each and every one of us have that chance to come to the light as he is in the light, to get out of the darkness of where we were at, to move into the light of his understanding, to, to see things from his perspective. Because people have often told me about what they say God is. And I just say, well, you don't know him. And they'll tell me, you know, well, he's a God of wrath. God is said, obviously you don't know him. They'll tell me he's a God of judgment. I'll say, well, obviously you don't know him. You know, once you find out that God is love, it makes sense, the things he does. The things that he said we wouldn't understand is true. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts beyond your comprehension. And in a lot of ways, some people think that's a cop-out. But you know, when I see how much love God has demonstrated to me by becoming flesh and dying on the cross, then I know my thoughts aren't like your thoughts. Because pre me personally, I would have wiped out the whole kit and caboodle, started over again. But that's not God, you see. God, for some reason hasn't wiped us all out yet. He hasn't like annihilated everybody and said, start over. He's given us a chance to really kind of get our act together and kind of grab a hold of maybe some truth and discover that now I get it. Because you see, it'd be kind of like stomping on a little baby. You don't go yelling at a little baby because it can't walk. You don't yell at a little baby because it can't talk. You don't yell at a little baby because it doesn't understand that it can't do what it wants to do. The same thing is true with you. <laughs> and that's why God is love. Because he can take his time to work with you. He can allow for a certain amount of time to transpire before you really understand who God is. But once you do, then the reality of knowing him in a more personal, intimate way as you relate to him, comes through studying or reading the Bible or going to church and you know, doing all the things that you kind of went, I don't think I like it. Well, go find where you like it. And then see if it helps you to know God in a more intimate and personal way. Because that's what we've been about ever since we started this. The whole concept of video was to relate what, well, to relate Jesus in a personal and intimate way, but meaning that to relate how I've had the same doubts, I've had the same fears or distrust or the same anxiousness or the same anger or the same fears, doubt, worries, cares, concerns, sins, all of it. Been there, done that. And I'm willing to admit it. You know, okay, yeah, that's me. No, no problem. Give me five minutes, I'll go out and sin. But also to relate how God deals with doubt in a personal and intimate way with you and with me. Just like he does with all the big saints we think are so super saints. You know, it's always interesting when you see like the Olympics, you know, because you see them 
win a gold sometimes. But if they're competing in more than one event, sometimes you see them win a gold in one event, and then when it's time for them to do something exactly like that again, sometimes they fail. And it shows the humanity of the person. Well, that's what I like about my relationship with God. It's not based upon how good I am, and it's not based upon how often I can do the right thing. It's really based upon me coming back to Him always and asking Him to lead me, to guide me, to forgive me, to teach me, and to instruct me in the way I should go. And that's why we have videos, you know, to learn as Him being the light of the world, what He would have us to see in a world that's gone completely dark and doesn't really know how to turn on the light, much less how to see where to go and what to do and how to be. The more that you see people trying to fix things, the more you realize most of mankind's ideas, they really don't know what they're doing. These things of the world hath God chosen. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extinguishers shall inherit the kingdom of God. One of the things I've read recently was that people were arguing about why a homosexual you know, is in the kingdom or not in the kingdom, how you can't be or can be a practicing homosexual or whatever. Well, it's pretty simple. It says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. The way you abuse someone is, you know, first of all, rape is an abuse. So, rapists, no, they're not going in the kingdom of heaven. They have to be forgiven. They have to be changed. They have to be they have to be renewed by their mind so that they're not constantly thinking of one aspect of a violent nature. They have to be changed from that violent nature to one of peace, of forgiveness, of mercy, of love. You see, God loves the person who has committed those sins, but he's willing to change that person to prepare them to come into the kingdom. He doesn't accept them as they are. He accepts what he's going to do in them because he can change them from their base nature to their godly nature that he wants to put inside them because they don't have a godly nature to begin with. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when the light of what God is doing comes to us, then we want to share that light with other people. So like a homosexual who is effeminate, which means that he's become more feminine than masculine, then he tends to enjoy that and participate that spiraling downward. It's like kind of like a kid that's playing in a mud puddle, you know? Whenever you get a little child that's playing in a mud puddle, try pulling that child out of that mud puddle. They don't want to get out. It's fun. It's a blast. As a matter of fact, when it's hot like this, it's probably very enjoyable. But as you and I know, a mud puddle isn't necessarily the best way to go swimming. <laughs> the same thing is true about life. While homosexuality is a sin, it's also a sin of confusion because what happens, it's not a matter of sexual choice. No, according to the Bible, it says that in the beginning they knew God and they chose to reject God about something in their life. So once they rejected that part, God gave them over to their own feelings of lust and burned in passion one towards each other. So it's something that God has done that has to be dealt with in order for the person to realize it's not a sexual sin that their problem is, although that's the consequences of it. The actual problem is a rebellion against something they didn't like that they saw when they were dealing with God personally. And that's where most people make the mistake about either homosexuality or any other sin, really. Because if it's deviant behavior, if it's completely corrupted like child molesters or, or homosexuals or lesbians or you name it. It's not because of a sexual preference. It's not because of a sexual orientation. It's not a sexuality sin per se. That's after the fact. It's kind of like when you have cancer, you don't deal with the headache that goes with cancer. You deal with the cancer cells. Otherwise, it'll kill you. That's the problem is that people look at some outward manifestation of a person who's in rebellion to God and then wants to still be with God. As you can see that a lot of people are trying to make up now this new way of, you know, like, well, let's just kind of like love the sinner and hate the sin and we'll make it all begin again. No, that's not the way it works. 
You see, when you sit down and talk to a person in the reality of where they're coming from, we all have rebelled against God. Each and every one of us. We've had to, at some point in time, sit down and say, yeah, you're right. I am a sinner. I have sinned like my fathers have sinned before me and my mothers have sinned before me and I was born in sin, conceived in sin, and if I don't do something, I'll die in sin. So, when a person rejects that, that God says, look, I'm looking at you, you got cancer, you're dying, and the person says, no, I don't, then that person needs to deal with the cancer. God says, you got cancer, you got to deal with it. You say, no, that's the same idea. The person rejects what God has revealed by his light, or his x-ray, so to speak. He says, I'm looking inside you. You got cancer, you're dying, you need the cure. Are you going to take the cure? No. I don't think I have cancer. I think you're wrong. I'm rejecting that. So God says, okay, fine. I'll let you go. You go your way, just like a doctor would. You can refuse medical advice, and it's called a RMA, refusing medical advice. And you sign a little waiver that says, hey, I don't want doctor's help. So you sign your RMA, and you walk right out, and you got a certain amount of time to live, and then you die from cancer because you refuse to deal with the fact that you have cancer. The same thing is true when you're dealing with any kind of rebellion against God. The fact is something is killing that person. And it's not homosexuality, it's not HIV, it's not AIDS, it's inside. The hurt of some kind or the rejection of God of some kind that they will not, in some stubborn way, accept God's love for what it is. And they, till you deal with that issue, you really don't deal with the problem that underlies the surface sin. And that's the same thing true of almost everything in life, really. you got to cut past the issues that people get all wound up about in religion and get down to the heart of the matter. Something deep inside that's really hurting, that really each and every one of us have the same. Because, quite frankly, when you love a person, and I mean anybody, homosexual, a child molester, a, a addict, uh, anyone, they respond. Now, it may be temporary in some cases, like with you know some of the terrible sins I've just described, or a terrorist even. You know, anybody, you name the worst sin you can imagine, and anybody, everyone, in some way responds to love, temporarily. Now, that overwhelming love that God has can cause a man to repentance, but it takes time, and it takes a chance of God to move in that person's life. And that's why each and every one of us, deep down inside, really, is dealing with something that requires God's love. And that's why God is love. Because without God in our life, we really keep trying to put things in there that isn't God's love. We keep trying to fill the void with something else that makes us feel good for a little bit of time. I can take two pills, you know, and take Excedrin and make my headache go away. But when it comes back, I still have a headache. It just made me forget about it for a while. Alcohol can do the same thing. So can drugs. So can sexual sins. You know, de-stressing yourself because you're doing some kind of sexual frustrated behavior. You know, whether it be the sin of masturbation or the sin of, you know, messing around with other people's wives or messing around singular. Because you're so wound up, you know, you've got to, oh, you know, I can't control myself. I need to go find somebody to make me feel better. Because you're ruled by feelings. But when you finally get to God, the amazing thing that happens is that God brings his light into the subject and you go, yeah, that was me. That's who I was. I was there, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. That's right. And when you admit that, when you say, yes, I can look out behind me and see that there's light, and you move towards that light, everything becomes a little clearer. So when you're sitting in darkness, you really don't understand what's going on. And that's what most people are, sitting in darkness. But as they begin to move to the light, a little bit at a time, they begin to understand a little bit more. And as we share that light, and I don't mean come right out and blast somebody out of the water with, you know, like, you don't go and stick someone in 110 degrees, you know, staring at the sun, you know, sitting on hot pavement and sidewalk and say, see the light? <laughs> No, you take them gradually to get used to it, and you put some sunblock on, you take them to the water park, you know, and you kind of get 
cool down. And then you begin to enjoy the sunlight. You begin to see what the sunlight does, like the garden that I have. You begin to participate in the idea that, hey, you know, the hot weather isn't so bad when you adapt to it. And maybe Christians aren't so bad when you learn to adapt to them. Maybe church isn't so bad when you take it a little bit at a time and you adapt to it. Because nobody coming straight out of darkness can walk directly into the light. And that's why we have to be, you know, bearers of the light that we have within. And one of the things that happened to Moses was that he had been so much in the presence of God himself that his face shined so brightly that they had to put a veil over him. Seriously. They had to put like a burqa on his face because he was so glowing and so full of light that the people were so sinful that they couldn't stand it. It just frustrated them. It got them angry. So they, they asked him, they said, could you put a veil over your face? And he did. He did it until gradually, being out of the presence of God, he quit shining as bright as he did. Because one thing about being in the light, you know, of God's light, is that just like sitting out in the sunshine, you're going to get a suntan, right? You're going to get burned. Well, God's kind of light isn't like that. You don't get burned, but you get brighter. Because <laughs> it kind of burns away all the all the extra stuff that you kind of added to it. You know, like all the things you want to bring along, like, you know, the Harleys, the games, the toys, the boys, the girls, the whatever it is. But when you get alone with God in that kind of light, that purity of just the fullness of God being made manifest to you and you see him for who he is, you're like, wow. Huh. And you have nothing to say. Everything falls away. Everything gradually melts away. And you just sit there and enjoy that God is love. Because while we say that God is light, really, that light is Him shining forth His love to you. He loves you. He always has. He always will. And whether you accept that love or not, or reject it and wind up in hell itself, it doesn't stop God loving you. It just means He has to separate Himself from you. Because He can't bear to be with someone who rejects His love. He's trying to share it with you.